I myself grew up very emotionally dysregulated and I never got an official diagnosis of BPD, but I, you know, there was a time in my adolescence when I was going from therapist to therapist and everybody knew something was wrong with me and nobody knew what it was and nobody could help, but everybody felt really free to tell me that I shouldn't be feeling the way I was feeling. It was really convenient for, inconvenient for everybody else. So when I went into clinical work, I wanted to work with folks like me, folks who had those big emotions that the people around them didn't understand, that nobody could help them manage because there is a way out. And I wanted to help people find it. Are you or someone you know struggling with borderline personality disorder? Then stick around because in this episode of the Mental Health Toolbox, we are unlocking borderline personality disorder treatment with certified DBT therapist and licensed clinical social worker, Catherine Humanic. So let's go. Hey, if you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to the MHT newsletter. That way you don't miss out on any new content as it's released and I have some free stuff waiting for you there as my little way to say thank you for subscribing. Also, if you know anyone who might benefit from this episode, please do share. It helps to raise mental health awareness and grow the channel. So let's dive in. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much for making time to be on the Mental Health Toolbox podcast today. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you on. And I just really respect the fact that you're taking time out of your busy schedule to share your words of wisdom around borderline personality disorder, which is a very uh, prime topic in the mental health space. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. So maybe you could share a little bit about who you are and your background and maybe how you got into this particular niche of mental health. So my name is Catherine Humanuk. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I have been working in mental health since 2015. And what really led me to, what led me to work in mental health actually was before this, I had a previous career in commercial real estate, hmm. uh, asset management and underwriting and that kind of thing. And I was good at it and I enjoyed it, but it didn't feel like I was fulfilling my purpose. I didn't feel like I was put on this earth to be really good at Excel spreadsheets. Um, and there are people who are and bless them and we need them, but it wasn't me. <laughs> so a friend of mine actually at the job I was at, she had worked at the School of Social Work while she was in college for her work study. And she said, hey, you know, have you ever thought about social work? I think it'd be a good fit for you. And, and um, I hadn't, I thought social work was all about food stamps and case management. I had heard all those nasty stereotypes and she encouraged me to look more into it because I was wrong and I looked more into it and I was wrong and I was very happy to be wrong. Um, and so on a whim, I applied, got in and you know, here I am. But I've always wanted to work with people with borderline personality disorder because I myself grew up very emotionally dysregulated and I never got an official diagnosis of BPD, but I, you know, there was a time in my adolescence when I was going from therapist to therapist and everybody knew something was wrong with me and nobody knew what it was and nobody could help, but everybody felt really free to tell me that I shouldn't be feeling the way I was feeling. It was really convenient for, inconvenient for everybody else. So when I went into clinical work, I wanted to work with folks like me folks who had those big emotions that the people around them didn't understand, that nobody could help them manage because there is a way out. And I wanted to help people find it. Wow, that's great. As it typically is, right? A lot of the time, uh, therapists get into this space because of their personal journeys, right? Their personal struggles and finding ways to address those things. Then we become very empathetic for passing that, paying that forward, right? Passing our knowledge along. I know that's why I got into social work and I did not have any exposure, funny enough, to social work, maybe like yourself and how I thought about it. It was never even top of mind growing up. Um, I was actually studying to be a pharmacist. <laughs> so um, not even that, I was all over the map. I was a first generation college student and didn't really know what I wanted I went x-ray tech, maybe ultrasound tech. I was considering that. And then 
did a little research on bang for your buck and pharmacy was at the top of the list. And so I started studying, uh, did that pre-med in sociology and then, yeah. And then I realized after a while it just wasn't for me. I was running away from some things that, uh, that wasn't a good motivation, you know, mm-hmm. motivation I have now is very much in line with my values and I'm glad I picked social work because I like to help the underdog and people who maybe got a rough start understand that it's not where you start off in life. It's everything in between and recreating ourselves and getting in scope. And so I can definitely relate to that aspect of uh, maybe not understanding the space until we're in it, but having leading with our passions, leading with our values and in the helping field. Right. Yeah. So that's fantastic. So uh, um, you obviously went for your, your MSW, right? And mm-hmm. then you got into the space of mental health. And at what point did you realize that borderline personality treatment could be its own full-time thing? Oh, that was, uh, I knew that before the program. Mm-hmm. So when I was having that conversation with my friend at work about, you know, what am I going to do with my life? I pretty much laid out, like, I had this, I had this really wonderful life-changing experience that helped me. And I wanted to be able to facilitate that for other people. So I knew that I wanted some kind of private practice. It was nebulous. You know, one day it was a a therapeutic ranch and, and one day it was a DBT program. And one day it was just so, individual private practice, but I always knew my clients would be people with borderline personality disorder. Oh, that's fantastic. So you had the vision. Mm -hmm. And as it goes with a lot of our goals, right, we don't necessarily need to have everything written in stone. In fact, we shouldn't because things never quite go according to plan. And what we want changes, right, our vision shifts, it's a moving target. But it is important to have something on the horizon, right? that you're moving toward. And so for you, it was definitely serving this population in some greater capacity than maybe what you could do through agency work, I assume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. and I started after graduate school, I worked in an intensive outpatient program. So there were a lot of folks with BPD there, but also a lot of folks with schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, major depression, uh, PTSD. And of course there's tons of overlap in the symptoms there. I worked in the IOP program and then I went and I worked in ER doing risk assessment. So I talked to people who had been brought in maybe by the police or maybe um, after a suicide attempt. And I would talk with them and see what the best place for them was gonna be, whether it was gonna be inpatient or back at home and doing outpatient care. So I did that for about about five years uh, before I started private practice. Wow. All right. So you have kind of a a nice, varied wealth of experience, right, to draw from. But you were at the same time, we're looking maybe for some common threads and the problems you were seeing. You're starting to identify those. Right. Mm -hmm. Good. When it comes to BPD or borderline personality disorder, not to be confused with bipolar disorder, which is, you know, same acronym. (laughs) Um. What do you feel are some common misconceptions about borderline disorder or some some myths that you've come across? So there's a lot of misinformation in the media. Uh, Most recently, last year with the Amber Heard trial, BPD started getting a whole bunch of attention and not in a compassionate educational way. There's a lot of misunderstandings. And I would say the biggest one is that people with BPD don't get better. I'm doing air quotes because that's not true. Mm -hmm. Um, We used to think that we being academia because we didn't have a treatment for it. And so people weren't getting better because we weren't treating them effectively. But that doesn't mean that that's true in the present. It just sounds like that's kind of been handed down from, you know, generations of supervisors to supervisees. And unless somebody actually is curious enough to go look into the research because they have a particular interest in that population, they're never gonna know that that information is outdated. 
So I think that's definitely the number one most harmful misconception. That you and have this thing and you're always going to have it and there's no cure and the best you can hope for is to just survive. Yeah. Right. And that's really, I mean, how could you possibly get somebody motivated for treatment if you say that to them on day one? Right. And not just any treatment. I mean, this is, it's a tall order, right? And I'm, I'm assuming that the, the primary mode of treatment is still dialectic behavioral therapy, right? There are some additional ones. Um, so we've also got mentalization-based therapy, schema-focused therapy, trans, uh, transference-focused therapy. Then there are some uh, purely skills-based ones like STEPS, which I am forgetting exactly what it stands for, but it's skills training, uh, something, something. I so apologize. <laughs> oh, no, you're fine. I know. Um, you know more than yeah. I'll ever, I mean, you'll forget more than I've ever known about this yeah. condition, so. Yeah, so there's lots of other treatments available now. Uh, how readily available they actually are in somebody's community may, may make them inaccessible in a practical way, but we do know that they're out there and that they exist. Um, DBT is still really the initial go-to. And what we know about DBT is that they have this wraparound program, so you can get skills training, individual therapy, 24 hour a day skills coaching, and then also having your uh, therapist be in their own consultation group to make sure that they're getting accountability as well. That's still the ideal gold standard. And whenever we can, uh, we want to provide that. But that's also from a systemic point of view, incredibly difficult to provide. Um, the group takes a six months to a year commitment many times. People can't always make that commitment for really practical reasons, right? Not their personal motivation, but just, I don't know if I could sign up to be somewhere twice a week for the next year. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how that I could expect that of the average person who's coming in for treatment either. Mm -hmm. So we do know there is a lot of research that just the skills of DBT are also incredibly effective. It may not be as great as the full wraparound program, but skills training, is still incredibly powerful and can make big changes for people. So however we can get them the skills, whether it's a group, whether it's individual, we wanna to try to get the skills to people as fast as possible after they're initially spotted for diagnosis because it can make a big change really fast. Thank you so much for mentioning that because I actually led a DBT program or assisted for a couple of years doing the groups, individual and, and the whole bit. And it is very intensive in terms of the draw on staff right and time and it's it's not an easy thing i think in terms of treatment to find especially at certain levels <clears throat> like medical and otherwise because it is so staff intensive mm -hmm. right but i'm happy to hear that it's still efficacious it sounds like to have maybe parceled out aspects of the treatment like the skills training yeah good good it was a big a big relief too and you know, in, in my own private practice, so I don't run a full comprehensive program. And the clients that end up coming to me are the people who they actually wouldn't be willing or able to go to a group at this point in their recovery anyway. Whether that's because they don't have the time, whether it's because they don't have the finances, whether they don't have the transportation, whether it's they just aren't comfortable enough talking about what they're going through to share it in front of other people. And so that actually would have been a barrier to them if that was mandated. So I do like being able to provide it to a different subset of the population that might not be able to access it otherwise. Yeah, that's good to know. Absolutely, Ac you know, any in, any uh, any access point is valuable. I'm sure when it comes to recovery, like like anything, right? We all have to start somewhere, and it's better to not get trapped in that all or nothing mindset, that black and white mindset when it comes to treatment, like it's important to just start somewhere, yeah. right? Any point of entry right? and, mm -hmm. and work from there, right? Do what you can with what you have with where you are. Exactly. Right? <laughs> Knowing your resources yeah. and not giving up, right? I mean, how, how discouraging is it when you, you're re finally ready to ask for help and then you're like, okay, let's go. And then you find out the first 10 people you reach out to aren't available and there's a by the time you get to someone it's a three month six month wait to be seen that's very discouraging yeah. and i would venture to guess that most people give up after the first call let alone 
10 or 15 attempts to get linked somewhere. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I've even, I found that in my own life being a therapist go to therapy, right? Where I've sent mm -hmm. out requests and I mean, and I'm behind the scenes, I know how it works. So I'll just send out 10 in a row. I'll just copy paste it all and I'll get one answer. And for me being behind the scenes, I know that that's not a rejection, um, but it's still really frustrating. And what if I don't vibe with that one person who does get back to me? Mm -hmm. um, and if I was just a client who had no prior knowledge and all I knew was that I was suffering and I didn't know how the system worked, that would be incredibly difficult to overcome. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that too, because that's definitely something I try and encourage clients to do when I'm reaching, when I'm referring out, I will say, okay, you know, whether it's psychology today or whatever, you know, jump on there, pick 10 that speak to you and use the email feature, right? Um, Cause as we know, like on those databases, if you use the email, then the therapist will get a text message and an email that somebody reached out to them. And um, therapists aren't always checking their voicemails because they're usually in session right mm -hmm. email they usually always have in front of them right yep. and so and picking i always say yeah like maybe one out of ten will get back to you don't take it personally <laughs> it's just a, it's just a supply and demand issue so um thank you for touching on that because i think that's important as we're talking about a targeted treatment like this which might even be a little harder to find in the private even in the private sector right people yeah. who, are, who are trained in dbt or otherwise to, to get linked right not just it's not just your run-of-the-mill treatment for anxiety or, or depression. It's very specific, kind of like you'd think of like PTSD, right? And EMDR or brain spotting or blonde exposure, right? It's a very specific kind of treatment. Yeah. 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 I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the lack of emotion regulation skills, right? Because I know that's a big part of the recovery process. So um, what's the what's the impact on on someone when they when they lack these skills i know in some of the the content you've put out you've you've talked on this subject about maybe what contributes to the development of uh borderline disorder right and how sometimes it's not it's not something that's learned along the way can you speak to that a little bit yeah so one thing that i will say is that i'm going to be picky because it's not a lack it's a lack of effective emotion regulation skills. People with BPD have plenty of emotion regulation skills. They're not effective in their environment, right? So, you know, for, for lack of a better example, getting angry, screaming, and throwing your phone is actually a very effective way to release the energy from the anger, to give it a voice, and to kind of get it out of your body. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we live in a world where if you're getting angry at people yelling and throwing your phone, uh, people are going to really, they might judge you for that. They might look down on you. They might not want to spend more time with you. If you hit them with your phone, that could be an assault. If you break your phone, now you have to go pay hundreds of dollars for your new phone. I think that distinction, I know I'm being kind of picky, but it's a really important distinction because People with BPD have very advanced emotion regulation skills. They're just not effective in the world that we live in. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. That's yeah, a there. huge distinction. Thank you for that because we do what we know. Yeah. And we do what we do because on some level it's worked. Exactly. Right? right? And all, all behavior is learned. Right? Exactly. And what we find is... So folks with BPD, the level that they feel emotion is partially, I can't give you a number. I wish I could say 60, 40, but I can't. Um, the research is still out. We know it's a little bit nature and a little bit nurture, and we don't know exactly what the recipe is. Um, partially the intensity of their emotions, and that's just how they're born. Some people feel their feelings bigger. And... What leads to borderline disorder is when those people with those big emotions are put in an environment where the adults around them do not know what to do with them. So your, your average, you know, neurotypical, mentally well baby, it cries, mom picks it up, maybe it just wants comfort, it stops crying. Or mom picks it up, smells the dirty diaper, cleans the diaper, baby stops crying. Or baby's tired, mom sings it a lullaby, baby falls asleep. 
I'm not a parent and I'm aware that I'm grossly oversimplifying parenting there. <laughs> that <sounds about> right. <laughs> That's the ideal picture. I'm sure all the parents listening are like, it is not that easy. Um, but generally speaking, right, the baby experiences some kind of discomfort. An adult comes, tends to it, fix the problem. The baby feels better, it stops crying. And then the baby gets a positive response from the adult. When the baby stops crying, the adult cuddles it more or says nice things or speaks to it in a soothing voice or pats its back or tucks it in or whatever it might be. And the baby will learn, okay, I have these big emotions, they're scary, but it's okay. I live in a safe world. These feelings don't last forever. They're not going to kill me. I just need some help with them. And then as the baby grows into a toddler, into a, a child, the baby will adapt those regulation skills on its own. Okay, I don't like it when I have a dirty diaper, I will take myself to the toilet. Mm -hmm. And then I won't have to be sad about having a dirty diaper. I don't like it when I'm really tired. Well, now I have nap time built into my day for as long as I need it. And then when I'm old enough that I don't need it, it's not built into my day anymore. Great. But when you have people with the with these really big emotions, you might get a baby that cries because it feels lonely. And if it takes mom 30 extra seconds to get there, or dad, or grandma, uh, the baby will feel like no one's coming and it will become inconsolable. So even when the parent gets there, the baby doesn't stop crying right away. Mm -hmm. And then mom thinks, I have three kids. Why is this one so hard? Mm -hmm. And mom's not being evil, dad's not being evil, grandma's not being evil. They're genuinely confused. Mm -hmm. Why? Everybody told me this would work. It works with my other kids. It works with my friend's kids. Why is this baby still crying? Mm -hmm. And then the caregiver will get frustrated. And now the baby learns, well, I cry. Nobody came to get me, which of course is an exaggeration, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are babies that do endure trauma that nobody mm -hmm. comes to get. Um, but, you know, I cried, I felt alone. And then when somebody came, they were mad at me for crying. Yeah. And of course, the baby doesn't have words for this. So they just internalize the feeling that being sad is intolerable. And when you have this happen 10 times a day for, you know, years and years, then what happens is in that baby's brain, that feeling goes from zero to 60 immediately. Now you'll have a five-year-old who, you know, the caregiver got out of the car and shut the door and didn't immediately open the door for them. And the child safety lock is on and the kid's like, I'm getting abandoned in this car. My, mm -hmm. my parents are leaving me in this car mm -hmm. and they're panicking and panicking. Finally, the door gets open. The kid starts crying. You left me in the car. You left me in the car. And the parent says, no, I didn't. I was right here. Yeah. And of course, there are also, you know, a child who is raised in an abusive environment. I'm not giving abusive examples, but a child who is raised in an abusive environment, by definition, that's very invalidating. But even if you just have a child who was born sensitive, if their caregivers can't pick up on that, don't know what to do with that, don't have the resources to handle that, then it will kind of snowball into this behavioral issue of, the feeling immediately becomes too big to manage. They're still a kid, they still need help. So now they have to have a behavior that matches the intensity of the motion in order to get any of the adults nearby to come and pay attention. What we know as protest behavior. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so it sounds like, you know, we're talking, like you said, about invalidating environments, but also kind of like the Thomas theorem, right? From a sociology, which states that if something is perceived to be real, it's real and it's often real in its consequences. Mm -hmm. So there's the abusive environment where there's intentional neglect, abuse, right? And then there is the inconsistent environments in which mm -hmm. creates room for the dependent to feel like their fears are, are accurate or believe mom, dad, whoever doesn't love me. They don't, you know, I don't feel safe. I'm not protected. I feel rejected. Those types of situations, right? And that can just stem from a place of maybe a caregiver feeling overwhelmed and not knowing how to be consistent, maybe first time parent, mm -hmm. uh, maybe not having enough support themselves, right, to know how to a parent more effectively. And that has maybe a, a compounded effect on somebody who already has is maybe neurodivergent, right, has these, you know, additional emotional challenges or is extra sensitive. And so the, 
they might take their emotion and run with it versus a parent who helps a child name their emotion and also link that to the context, mm-hmm. right? Um, I think one of your posts on Instagram, I was thumbing through, gave a really good example of that, right? About, I can't remember what the, what the example was, but it was basically, yeah, so you're feeling this way because, mm-hmm. right? You're feeling this way because you wanted such and such and that didn't happen. Now mm-hmm. I could see how that would be very disappointing, yeah. right? As opposed to saying, just shaming the emotion, you know. Yeah, stop, like, stop I think I think what you're talking about is, uh, you know, a kid drops their toy in the mud or something, mm-hmm. and the parent says, "Oh no, are you sad?" So their name, the kid is just crying, but they don't know they don't know what sadness is yet. They don't have mm-hmm. words like that. So a parent comes in and says, "Oh no, are you sad? Are you sad because you dropped your toy in the mud and now it's dirty?" And then the kid can go, yes, I dropped my toy. And then the parent can say, well, let's take this toy and clean it up. Mm-hmm. Or, or even like, okay, well, here's a different toy. Or even, um, okay, well, now it's dirty, but you can still play with it. You know, I don't know. But there's lots and lots of ways to kind of narrate for the child that it's going to be okay, even though the toy is dirty. Uh, I love that. The narration, right? You're giving yeah. them- the child the language that they can use internally right moving forward a, a coping skill and how to explain a situation as not being black and white as opposed to focusing on what they're unhappy with what are their options right okay. what can we do and then on the end, oh sorry mm-hmm. like what can we do with this situation it's, it's okay to feel upset but then what do we do with what are you know our options and that's a powerful coping skill we all we all use right but then on the other hand, you might get a kid who drops their toy in the mud and starts crying and the parent says, shut up, I'm watching TV. Mm-hmm. Or, of course, you dropped your toy in the mud because you're a dirty kid. You're always mm-hmm. doing stuff like this. Or, will you stop crying? I'm, you know, you're just trying to make me feel like a bad parent. Mm-hmm. And those mm-hmm. examples individually, I'm sure every parent has had a moment where they were like, please shut up, I'm just watching mm-hmm. TV. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's a creating an environment of invalidation, not an episode of invalidation. Mm-hmm. If on balance, the child knows that when they feel a big emotion, it's going to be okay, then we're good. If on balance, the child knows, Ooh, every time I have a big emotion, somebody gets mad at me or it's my fault or I get ignored, then we start to see those behavior patterns develop where they have to compensate for compensate or overcompensate right either contain 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 boom right? mm-hmm. <laughs> or okay i'm just going to take it to another level higher i'm going to protest this yeah. this thing until i'm heard right mm-hmm. it becomes basically a screaming match yeah. yeah neither is a good good outcome right yeah. and i think i think we what i tend to see is by the time by the time this child is now a teenager or a young adult and they've gotten this diagnosis and they've you know they've started to do this research what i hear from the parents is well i i didn't abuse my child Mm -hmm. i treated my kid just like every other kid right and then if we go back to that example of the kid feeling like they're locked in the car even though it may have been 30 seconds that's not abuse it's not right but if the kid is crying, saying, you were, you were going to leave me, you were going to leave me, and the parent says, no, I wasn't, then all the kid has learned from that exchange is, I'm pretty sure what I felt was real, but everybody's telling me it's not real, so I don't really know what's real. Hmm. If the parent says, it must have been really scary for you to be in the car, then the kid learns, okay, that feeling was called fear, and then the parent can say, but here I am now. Hmm. So that's certainly not abuse, but if it was just a pattern of the parents just didn't understand why the kid was having such big feelings and was just like, stop, the facts are this, mm-hmm. it's not as helpful as maybe they think it is in that moment. Right. They're just trying to fuse it, but really, if we just take that extra effort to validate the, subject, the subjective experience, regardless of who the person is and how old they are, because even adults need this, we all mm-hmm. want to feel Absolutely. heard. Right. at any age 
that's all anybody really wants is to be heard. Um, and then we can accept the contributing factors, right? The reality, the external factors, I should say, right? But until we feel validated or heard, it's going to be very hard to then focus on what did or didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. Based on our understanding. So it's a very good point. So you, we've talked about the invalidating environments. What else comes into play when one is trying to diagnose a borderline personality disorder? Because I know it's a little tricky. It's not as simple as that. Yeah, it's, it's pretty tricky. Um, I think there is a lot of, there's a lot of misconception about diagnosis of BPD. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions is in order to get the diagnosis, you have to have some sort of self-harm or suicidal ideation in your history. And you do not. Hmm. I would say the majority of people with BPD do, but it is not a required criteria. There are nine symptoms that are listed in our diagnostic manual, and you have to have five. But they, whatever iteration of those symptoms that you have, whether you have five or six or seven or eight, and which five you have or whatever, they just have to create a pattern of emotional instability and unstable relationships. That's really the big picture. So we hear sometimes about quiet BPD, and what you might see people with quiet BPD is they have all the same symptoms, but the pattern of emotional stability is not visible from the outside in. These are folks who learned to deal with their emotions by pretending they don't exist. So they're still feeling them on the inside, but nobody on the outside would know. They're not acting on them. Um, and it's also really tricky to diagnose because there are so many symptoms that overlap with these other diagnoses. So I can't tell you how, I think there is research, I don't remember the exact statistic, but it's an incredibly large number of folks with borderline are initially diagnosed with bipolar because they come into the therapist's office or the psychiatrist's office and they describe how they are outside of the office. And it sounds like these really big changes. And if you don't ask how, like what the duration of those episodes is, mm -hmm. it could be bipolar, right? Oh, I get really impulsive and I think really highly of myself and I, you know, I decide I'm going to start a new business and change my hair and do all this. And the psychiatrist goes, oh, okay, like manic episode. And anecdotally, I find that this misdiagnosis often happens if the person doesn't fit the stereotypical picture of BPD. Mm -hmm. So if they don't self-harm or if they can hold down a job or whatever it might be, if they're not ticking those stereotype boxes, the psychiatrist won't even think borderline. They'll say, here's this person sitting in front of me who looks totally normal describing this chaos. It, that chaos must have happened during a manic episode. They must be bipolar. Hmm. That makes sense. I, I remember in graduate school, they had a chart. I don't know how much things have changed, but back then it was assumed that 72% of people diagnosed with bipolar 2 were actually would have better met the criteria for borderline personality disorder. And that's a big distinction when we're talking about the difference between a chemical imbalance, mm -hmm. which is more or less kind of a, is more of a permanent kind of thing that can be managed versus a, a, a psychologically developed condition that can be reprogrammed mm -hmm. right in essence i don't know if there's a, a savvier way to say that but that's kind of how i think about it you know and the, and the difference and even we, we could go into a whole rabbit hole of just bipolar disorder in itself right and you know bipolar one versus bipolar mm -hmm. two versus bipolar rapid cycling versus so on and so yep. forth right <laughs> um, seasonal versus etc uh yeah, so it gets a little a little sticky in the diagnostic area. That's why I was curious, you know, um, because I know those who, you know, that, that term gets thrown around, oh, this person's borderline or that person's borderline. Really, oftentimes what's being referred to are borderline traits as they're thought of, right? Like the splitting or the protest behavior, the fear of abandonment, the rejection, um, the impulsivity, the, the self-harm, the cutting, the headbanging, all of that, you know 
promiscuity, the substance use, the you know that are easily generalized into a, a bucket. You know, mm-hmm. and I think we need to be careful as consumers of mental health, as practitioners of mental health. Um, and the general population, which is why I'm so glad you're on today, so we can raise a little awareness around this, is that we need to be very careful about how we generalize. Because those labels already have enough stigma attached, right? Which is a big part of the problem to begin with. And there's so many symptoms that are Mm transdiagnostic. So by that, what I mean is that you might find the same symptom. You might find impulsivity in bipolar you might find impulsivity in ADHD. You might find impulsivity in borderline. You might find impulsivity in PTSD. You might find impulsivity in a lot of different things, in autism, Mm -hmm. right? There's a bajillion different things where you might find impulsivity. So using impulsivity as, oh, that's how I know this person has this diagnosis is tricky. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the way that we diagnose is imperfect and we have to work within the system that we have for now but i think what happens is the general public people who don't spend their lives deep diving into the research (laughs) um which why should they (laughs) um the general public we the way that we talk the way that we communicate about mental health to the public is we say here's this diagnosis and here's an infographic about it And, you know, if you're most of these, then you might have this. And what people come to think is that a diagnosis is an on-off switch. Mm -hmm. Either I have anxiety or I don't. I have depression or I don't. I have PTSD or I don't. And And that one day I'll be able to just flip that switch off and I won't have depression or I won't have anxiety or I won't have PTSD. And that is really oversimplified. And I don't think, I don't think that's a helpful way to think of oneself as having five things where the switches are flipped on and trying to flip these switches off. I think it's a lot more helpful to think of, I think of dimmer switches. Mm, I like that. And and instead of there's a BPD dimmer switch and you have it all the way up or not, no, there's an impulsivity dimmer switch and that's up or down. There's a quickness to anger and that's up and down. There's a likelihood to act on the anger and that's up and down. There's a quickness to return to baseline, and that's up and down. There's a difficulty reading faces, and that's up and down. There's a propensity to interpret faces as negative, that's up and down. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. And you have 10,000 dimmer switches, and you know, 20 of them would be under the impulsivity umbrella. And if most of those are turned up, we would say you're impulsive. And then we've got another umbrella of fear of abandonment. And that's got 20 different switches. And if most of them are turned up, we would say you've got fear of abandonment. And then that might be autism and it might be BPD and it might be ADHD. Yeah. It, might, it might be labeled with attachment disorder. <laughs> it might be attachment disorder. How old is the person? How long has it been going? You know, like all of these factors. And that's really... You know, when we're diagnosing people, that's what we as professionals should be thinking of as a wall of 10,000 different switches. Mm -hmm. But it's really hard to communicate that to the public instead of just, okay, you have BPD or you don't. Right. Everybody wants a simple answer. The problem with simple answers is that's what leads to stigma. Right. Like that I have versus I experience. Mm -hmm. I have experienced anxiety. I have experienced trauma. Mm -hmm. Right, it's not a fixed thing. It's an ex- like mm-hmm. you said, sometimes when the intensity of those experiences are cranked up, then it you know it flags maybe a, a label. But I like to think of diagnoses oftentimes as a compass. You know, the reason we have diagnoses to begin with, same thing in the medical field, so that they have something they can target, mm-hmm. right? And they, it could be wrong. It could yeah. change, right? doesn't mean that it's it's uh, salient or fixed. Right. Yeah. And that's, you know, in, D- in DBT and in many other therapies, we start with the life-threatening behavior first, whatever we're going to call that. You want to call it depression and you're suicidal? Fine. You want to call it BPD and you're suicidal? Fine. We're going to target the suicidal thoughts. And then once those have been managed yeah. effectively, then we can target, okay, well, what's the next most serious thing going on? I just heard a, a really, 
really wonderful presenter. His name is Alan Frizzetti. Uh, he is part of the National Education Alliance for Borderline Personality Disorder, mm -hmm. which conflict of interest disclosure, I am on the board. <laughs> but um, he just gave this really wonderful presentation and he was talking about insomnia. And he was saying, we tell people, well, you have insomnia because you're depressed. Mm. But they could be depressed because they have insomnia. Oh, yeah. And they could be impulsive because they're not sleeping. And they could have insomnia because they're mismanaging their diet or something like that, mm -hmm. right? There's, mm -hmm. there's so many different causes that interplay. And to simply write somebody off and say, okay, well, you're depressed and that's why you can't sleep. And so here's a sleeping med and here's a depression med. We're not actually fixing the problem for that person. Mm -hmm. And if we call it depression, we haven't helped that person. But if we say, man, not sleeping sure is one heck of a problem that is having a domino effect on the rest of your quality of life. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out how to get you some sleep. Let's do a sleep study. Let's get some labs drawn, take a look at that. And then once, once you're sleeping, then we'll take a look at your mental health because half of this might go away. Right. As opposed to getting tunnel vision on one particular idea and one symptom and just running with that, right? It's about the holistic bird's eye view and, and making sure we don't lose sight of the other moving parts, right? the, the other lever, levers we can pull, right? And like mm -hmm. you said, there's definitely a hierarchy, right? Yeah. When we're talking about treatment with anything, right? So risk, <laughs> right? And then basic needs and then quality of life kind of in that yeah. order. Yeah, I mean, I even in my own life, um, I, I take vitamins, but I'm a child. So I buy each individual vitamin in gummy form. So that way I get to have like 10 gummies nice. every day. That's love, how I motivate myself to take my well, I love gummy bears as a kid, right? I'm a camp for the only one. <laughs> <laughs> um, no multivitamin for Catherine. Um, but I was, I, I was having a lot of trouble sleeping and I was talking to my psychiatrist at the time and she actually did a really comprehensive holistic workup. And she asked me about my vitamins. I say, I take my vitamins every day. She said, okay, what do you take? And you take them. I said, well, I take all of them before bed. They're like dessert. And she goes, you take your B vitamin before bed? And I said, yeah, with all my other vitamins. Because I'm great at taking vitamins. Right. And she goes, okay, well, that's why you can't sleep. Take that in the morning and then see what happens in two weeks. And that was it. That was the fix. Mm. I didn't need CBT for insomnia. I didn't need better sleep hygiene. I mean, I'm certain I would benefit from it, but really the fix in that moment was to take my B, B vitamin in the morning. Right. And had I gone to somebody with tunnel vision, we never would have caught that. I would have been on a sleep med. I would have maybe groggy all day, you know. Makes sense, especially B3. Niacin. Yeah. <laughs> Niacin is a, well, I'm not a, I'm not a registered dietitian or anything. Um, but it can be used to increase your energy. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. So great point. Yeah. It's easy to, it, it would have been easy for a clinician to just say, Hey, add a boy, take your vitamins, add a girl, you know, mm -hmm. good job. You know, like you said, pat on the back and not pause to think about, well, what does that mean? Vitamin could be a number of things could be taking other supplements on top of those vitamins that weren't even, they just drive right past and aren't talked yeah. about. Right. Um, I have clients that take like five HTP and I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait, what, <laughs> what do you mean on top of antidepressants and stuff? And then you're, you know, there's a whole serotonin syndrome and other things you can potentially have problems with. So it's important to kind of take the time when you're doing an assessment to kind of tease that stuff out and not drive past it too quick. Cause you never know, you never know yeah. what's going to be relevant. And think about, think about the potential domino effect of that, right? If I wasn't sleeping, how much more dysregulated was I during the day? And if I'm that much more dysregulated during the day, how is my environment responding to me? Because I'm having to work overtime to use my skills and I'm probably still getting invalidated more often than usual. Mm -hmm. And how long does that cycle have to go on before, well, now I have insomnia because I have borderline, mm -hmm. right? And oh, that's just the thing that people with BPD have, right? right? Versus part of the package, accept it. Yeah. Radical acceptance. No. Right. <laughs> Radical acceptance is still my favorite, but yeah, that would have been an inappropriate. You radically <laughs> accept the things we can't change. <laughs> Don't, yeah. But it's important to identify the things we can, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Good. 
So we've talked a lot about treatment, diagnosis. What do you feel are some of the barriers to accessing care for this particular challenge? I think the supply and demand is a, a big barrier. I think there's so much stigma even among clinicians against BPD that nobody wants to work with them. That's not nobody, but people who want to work with folks with BPD are probably in a DBT clinic already, um, or they're probably running a dedicated private practice already if you have a passion for working with borderline. Mm -hmm. And there's just not as many of them as meets the need, which then means that it's much more expensive, which then means that the average person can't afford it. There's also the barriers of just the time commitment of DBT, not everybody can. Right? If someone's working three jobs to keep their head above water, they cannot commit to coming to skills group and individual. Um, and that's not their fault. If they're working a job that doesn't give them a consistent schedule, that's not on them. Mm -hmm. um, and if the program can't work around it because skills group is Tuesday and Thursday and you have to come Tuesday and Thursday and you have to meet 90% of your appointments, then they're set up for failure, right? So there's, there's not enough supply because of all the stigma among clinicians, there, the supply that does exist is really expensive. Um, I don't know, and I am, my experience is incredibly limited, of course, but I have never come across a community mental health agency that runs a comprehensive DBT program. Community mental health runs IOP, mm. absolutely, and they use DBT, but it's not a, sign up and come for six months and, and do the whole program through. It's, right. oh, today we're doing this skill and this activity and then tomorrow we're going to do Sure, pick out of the modules kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's, I mean, really when I think of it and from my experience, it's very limited supply and very high cost. Do you have any suggestions? Because I found that to be the case as well. Do you have any suggestions for what somebody can do who maybe is having trouble finding a robust program? What's the next best thing? We do know that uh, treatment by, what was, I think the way the study phrased it was treatment by experts. So people, clinicians in the community who don't run DBT programs, but they want to work with people with BPD and they were identified by other therapists in the community as that's where we send our borderline mm. referrals. It's not as good as DBT, but it's a heck of a lot better than just a random therapist off of psychology today. Mm -hmm. So any therapist who is willing and able to work with borderline and seems knowledgeable about it, you know, obviously do your due diligence, ask them questions, can't make a guarantee, but even if somebody's not running a DBT program, if they are willing and able to work with somebody with borderline and they seem knowledgeable about it, they are likely to be much more effective as a provider. Um, there's the DBT skills we know are very effective regardless of how they're delivered. And there are a lot of new ways. Uh, there's, there's really good YouTube videos even. Um, you can get a workbook. There's a lot of different workbooks. There's the Green Book. If you really like reading, it's a great one. There's the Neurodivergent Friendly DBT Skills Workbook, which um, is laid out a lot different. Um, there are online DBT classes, like skills classes, that aren't restricted to location. So I know that there are a couple different places that do just, they do Zoom once or twice a week for maybe a much shorter period, like a 12 week period. So there's lots and lots of entry points to DBT that I think the purists would probably panic hearing me recommend them. Uh, but I do think an entry point into DBT skills is better than no entry point. It's better to, to learn about it and try it out mm -hmm. than to have no access to it whatsoever. Totally agreed. Absolutely have a holding space where you can work on things and, you know, till the time does come where you can get linked up to a formal program. If it's even advantageous at that point, you may find that you work through stuff on your own or with your, with your regular therapist anyway. Yeah. So well said. And I know you're a wealth of information. That's why I asked. 
<laughs> and I, I drove through your website and saw you have a great reading list there. So we'll take a peek at that in just a second. Um, there are some absolutely yeah. wonderful books out there. Yeah. So we've established then BPD, borderline personality disorder, is not a permanent condition, mm-hmm. is the, the thought, right? Yeah. The, most of the symptoms on that diagnostic criteria list, most of those symptoms are learned behavior. And you can unlearn them if you're put in an environment that is not constantly invalidating. Right. Right. We parent ourselves. Yep. With some help and a good support system. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. Good. So last thought, what have you found to be a catalyst in terms of treatment, right? And recovery for borderline personalities or by catalyst, I mean, like, what do you feel really helps get things moving in the right direction faster? Typically. I think What I see in the folks I work with is I see kind of two two points along a journey that tend to make a really big difference. The first one is radical acceptance of the way things are right now, because that is hard. Mm -hmm. It is really hard. And I often feel almost guilty teaching people radical acceptance and saying like, yeah, it's garbage. All right can't fix it all today we're gonna try but we can only fix one thing at a time so it's just gonna be garbage for a while and I know that for me that idea was extremely freeing um but not every I was ready to hear it when it was presented to me and so I know for a lot of folks there's a lot of resistance to radical acceptance and it makes perfect sense but I do see the first big jump in recovery happening when people go okay I can't fix it all today, which means I have to accept some of this crap right now. Mm -hmm. And then I don't have to fight it. And then that frees up so much energy and so much space where I can just go be a person Mm -hmm. without having to be so angry at the way things are, justifiably angry in many cases at the way things are, right? That's the first big jump. And then the second big jump comes, Almost all of my clients at one point or another, they'll come in and they'll, they'll, they'll say, can, can I say like a medium curse word? Of course. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> they'll good. come in and they'll be like, I'm the asshole. Mm-hmm. Like it's me. And it's not, it's not all of the time, right? And it's certainly not, nobody woke up in the morning and decided to be an asshole. Nobody was born an asshole. Mm-hmm. But they'll have some experience out in the world between sessions and they'll realize it was them. Like maybe the situation wasn't great, but their behavior really escalated the situation and their behavior was inappropriate for the situation. And when they can realize that without shame, Mm. like when they can just come in and go like, oh, like this is great information because it's not happening to me. I'm a part of it and I can change my part of it. Mm. And again, it's it's not a shamey, blamey, moment it's truly like isn't this great news because this means it's not going to keep happening to me all like out of nowhere I can actually do something about this Mm -hmm. so I see that's very a non-clinical way to describe it but I love it I see those two moments as really being these catalysts for recovery the first one of radical acceptance of okay I don't have to fight every living moment of my day and then the second one being like oh okay I am, I am a player in this, and that means I get to be a player yeah. in making it a positive situation. Ownership. Yeah. Yeah, like you see with any kind of recovery, right? It's yeah. a big part of it, right? With with 12-step, it's the serenity prayer, right? And owning our, 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 our role, right? With anything, with any change that's necessary. And that's change is happen. hard enough. Change is hard <laughs> enough. But until, like you said, we free up that mental energy, to one, we can be comfortable in our own skin a little bit, and then we can start to see the options and opportunities, right? Because intense emotions create tunnel vision. That's why anger isn't typically effective. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. Thank You're you a wealth so of information, happy. obviously, which is why I'm so glad you were willing to be on today to share this with us. Um, where can our listeners learn and more about you and the work you're doing? 
You can find me on Instagram or Facebook at Catherine LCSW. And that's Catherine with a C. Mm -hmm. And uh, bpdeducation.com, which is still very much in the works, but, but it does have on the blog, you'll, you can find a reading list, um, you can find a resource list. I have a free mailing list. Uh, you'll, you'll probably won't even get an email from me once a month, but every time you do, it'll have some free resource for you, whether it's a podcast link or um, a pamphlet or something like that. And when you sign up for the mailing list, you get automatically every freebie that I've ever put out all at once. So um, a little bit about explaining BPD to a loved one, how to validate a loved one, if you have BPD, a crisis kit, a safety plan, all that good stuff. Excellent. Excellent. I like the way your site's organized with uh, all the information. Easy to find, right? Easy on the eyes. Good. Great information. Thank Wonderful. you. Yeah. It's wonderful. And that was the uh, mailing list, right? Over here? Yep. So if you just right? go to bpeducation.com, the mailing list thing is right there. Uh, I just get your first name and your email address. And really about once, less than once a month, you'll get a new freebie. Uh, but right away, you get everything that's ever gone out. That's wonderful. And all your socials at the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. We'll want to follow you there and learn more. I know your Instagram is blown up. Yeah, Instagram is, is the most popular one. And then actually my LinkedIn is pretty active as well, but it's a it's a very different audience. My LinkedIn is mostly other clinicians uh, and my Instagram is mostly followed by folks with BPD or family members of folks with BPD. Nice. This is your Instagram. Mm -hmm. Nice. Very good. I love how you have your, uh, I forgot what these are called. These the highlights. Highlights. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Highlights, uh, nice and organized for for your visitors. That's great. That's wonderful. I can tell you put a lot of, of thought and love into the the information you put out. So I appreciate that. Yeah, it's definitely something that um, you know, being on social media is such a such a double edged sword, um, <laughs> isn't it? I I really I really really enjoy being able to put out accurate, non-stigmatizing information because I know that people who are newly diagnosed, they put borderline personality disorder into Google and they're heartbroken right away. Mm -hmm. um, so I like being able to put out information that is higher quality, less stigmatizing, more hopeful. Um, and also having a big audience also means that a lot of people who have personal opinions about BPD come and find me too. Yeah. <laughs> so it always means a lot when somebody says they can see the work I put into it. Yes. Well, it does show for sure. And this is a great reading list you have here on your site for uh, self-education, right? Yeah. Workbooks. I'll be sure to add all this uh, to the description, show notes, yeah. so that it's easy to find, okay? All right. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. I really appreciate you being on. Would it be okay if I had you back on down the road, see how things are coming along? Absolutely. I would love that. Thank Excellent. You. Well, thank you, Catherine, for your time. I know you're an hour ahead over there in Utah. I'm in LA. It's night. Was it? You said 15 degrees over there. So, uh, let's oh. see. It's, oh, we've gone up to 28 since this morning. Oh, so all right. Very, nice and warm, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you enjoy that uh, nice winter wonderland um, and your day. And I will circle back to you down the road. Uh, always Thanks. feel free to reach out to anything we can do to support your work. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been such Thank a pleasure. You. My pleasure. You take care. Hey, if you're getting value from this content and you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also like this video. And if you happen to be listening, be sure to subscribe to the podcast. And if you're listening on Apple podcasts, it would mean the world to me. If you'll just take a moment to leave a review, it really does a lot to boost the reach and raise mental health awareness. And so I hope you found some value and you have some new tools to thrive. Until next time, make good things happen. Bye-bye.